So, um, yeah, I'm here to talk about my, my le the lessons I learned on uh, the experimental edge. Um, and it's mostly WebRTC that uh, I worked on a project recently and um, learned a few things with WebRTC that I wanted to share. Originally, the talk that I wanted to give was about tinnitus and web technology, but I didn't have enough research to kind of put it all together properly. So if anyone wants to talk to me about that, I'm still doing it at some point, but talk to me later on in the day. So um, this whole thing came together with uh, basically uh, Google had some people approach developers and uh, basically said, we want you to build an experiment. We're going to pay you some money to do it. We want you to use cool technology in uh, mobile browsers. We're going to show it off at Google I.O. Are you interested? So I was like, hmm, demo where, be paid, hell yes. So pretty easy uh, decision. And, and at that point, it, there was no real spec. It was just use whatever technology you, you want. So it could be WebGL. It could be um, CSS, uh, 3D CSS. Um, and I chose to use WebRTC. Um, I'm running the, the, the game in the background just to get me an idea of what I actually built. Um, one idea that we had was to use two mobile phones as kind of lightsabers, so you could use the orientation events and kind of the web, API, the web audio API to kind of work out that the two phones had collided in an invisible lightsaber. But in the end, I like the idea of um, actually putting someone's face inside of the, the mobile phone and, and uh, having, having people kind of throw things at that face. Um, and it was based off of, um, I, I don't know if anyone remembers, the, the Yahoo Faceball game where um, from about 2008, pretty simple game, you sit opposite each other and you throw balls at each other's face. It's called face ball. So I kind of ripped off that idea. Um, and the idea is simply throw balls at each other's face, first one of three wins. Um, it uses uh, WebRTC, uh, audio, video, peer-to-peer uh, -peer data, orientation of events, and a whole bunch of other bits of technology. So it was a real kind of um, uh, just demo where, basically. Um, I have got one big caveat for this talk as well. I'm not going to be talking about cool words like stun servers, uh, which just makes me think of Star Trek, um, turn servers, uh, or turn the security protocols. This is, a, this is from a web developer's point of view. Um, it's what we can do with those, or what I did with those building, building bricks, how I kind of cobbled things together without really fully understanding all the technology there and how I got away with it. Um, and I, I, I was watching my son um, put some, uh, move forward, yeah, put some bricks into this, uh, this, this wall that he's got. And I realized that my, my uh, development approach is pretty similar, where I basically just take a piece of technology and I ram it against the wall until it fits through. I just keep turning and pushing, and eventually it drops through. And that's basically my programming approach. He's got it, you know, age 20 months. And then occasionally you take a shape that doesn't quite fit in a hole, and you just push it and it fits anyway. It's like, ah, you know, it works. Um, so it means that I will quite happily take WebRTC and put it into a project without needing to understand how it's doing all its communication, just to know that it actually works. And uh, this is a, that, this high-level version of that talk, basically. So uh, that doesn't mean that retrospectively I won't go back, look at the technology, and try to understand it. It's just that it's so new that I just need kind of a shortcut uh, and wanted to come in at a high level, basically. So there's, there were two tranches of work in this project that, um, that caused me pain, I guess is probably the best way of uh, putting it. The real-time communication side of things, so WebRTC, uh, which this talk will be mostly about. Um, and hopefully, I'll have time to get onto the graphics stuff. Uh, I've got a few, a few notes. But graphics and performance, and because the target platforms, because it was for Google I.O., it was uh, you know, Google Nexus 4 and 7, those are their, their hero products. Um, I found out some interesting things in terms of performance there. Um, again, because it was, a, it was demo where I only had to at least work in uh, Google uh, Chrome for Android beta. And this technology is under a, you know, a, a, a settings flag. So you actually have to physically go in and enable this. So it's great for me in terms of a, pla a playground, but obviously it's not kind of uh, works in every single browser at this point in time. Um, but at the moment, the game works on uh, Chrome for Android beta. Um, I do plan to add support for iOS, you know, that old, that old browser, uh, the old uh, platform. Um, and it should work in Firefox, but I've not tested it. So, you know, if you do have a look at the links at the end and it doesn't work in Firefox, it's because I haven't tested it at all, but plan to. So, 
WebRTC. Ah, this amazing technology. It's, um, it's a bit too early to do kind of angel singing, right? Um, there's three main APIs inside of WebRTC. There's get, media, uh, get user media, which is access to um, the webcam, the uh, microphone, uh, basically the thing that Flash had for you know, a solid 10 years. And I think, uh, well, certainly get user media was kind of starting to emerge last year. It's, it's the, the API is kind of stable. You can use it in uh, evergreen browsers today quite happily. Um, and I've got some example code. Um, but the real, the, the WebRTC side of things are the two other APIs, which are the peer connection API, which is once we've got a stream from your machine, we can send it off to uh, another user in the room. So it's, it's literally peer-to-peer, -peer, which means there are no, that you don't need a server for that data to go from one device to another. So my laptop can stream video to your mobile phone inside of this local network without going via a server. And then the third API is the data channel API, which is the same, it, it, it's basically sockets over that peer-to-peer. -peer. And the interesting part is its, uh, its ability to do UDP, which is an appeal for game developers. And I appreciate, I built a game, and I'm not a games developer. I'm, I'm very much just a hack and see what sticks. Um, but I know that UDP is, is supposed to be good for games. Um, so that is landing in browsers now. So, like any uh, good or bewildered developer, I first turned to JavaScript libraries to actually solve the problem for me or to give me a head start, basically. So, um, this isn't extensive, and I expect more, there are more JavaScript libraries out there now, and this will grow. Um, but these are some of the ones I came across, and I knew that I wanted to do the project in JavaScript from top to bottom, so I wanted a node at the back end. Um, I found, you know, uh, peer.js seemed to only do uh, data. This may not be accurate. Nah. This may change or this may not be completely accurate because I was working under a deadline. But peer.js seems to just do data but does it very, simply, uh, very easily. Um, a, simple art, a simple web RTC just did video and didn't do data and I wanted both because I wanted to be able to send you know, messages saying I've thrown the ball at your face and that would be the data part. Um, easy, uh, easy RTC I didn't look at because I found that uh, webrtc.io.js was a nice uh, node library that came with a client side library and just kind of dropped in and the really appealing thing for me is there was a nice, simple demo that was very, very hackable. Um, I got a prototype of this project up and running in a couple of hours just by hacking their demo, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. The thing to be extremely wary of is this is super new technology. These were the versions of uh, modules I was working with, you know, not even 0.1. Um, this is a very, uh, the, the libraries are evolving really quickly at this point in time. So, I'm pretty sure the libraries I'm, I, I deployed a month ago are already out of date now. There's been fixes, and I can see fixes that, that I could plug in myself. So, that aside, this is my, uh, this is my prototype. Um, so, this was literally an hour's worth of hacking. I just took a photo of a drawing I did and stuck my face on. So, this is a screencast off my desktop, and uh, the video feed's coming from my mobile phone, and the orientation events are being streamed from the phone directly into the desktop and just doing a CSS rotate. Very simple, and that was my proof of concept that I could build this game easily, which was um, uh, completely uh, underestimated the amount of work, but it, uh, it was a nice proof of, proof of concept. Um, like I said, the, this was hacked from the WebRTC IO uh, demo, and uh, the nice thing about these libraries is that it kind of levels out all the, the different interoperability issues. There's lo several versions of p the peer data uh, implementation as time went on. Um, if you look at the code, there's things like peer data 00, zero or peer data or WebKit peer data and, and so on. Um, and it does things like try to uh, do interop between Firefox's um, uh, video and uh, Chrome's video as well for you, so you don't have to do that yourself. So that, to replicate this, this simple example, there's really only three steps. First one is um, create a room. Um, for two people to join in. Because I'm doing a two-player game, I want some kind of discoverability to say, this is, in terms of the game, I had a pin code. So I say, right, my pin code is one, two, three, four. You would join that and we would play against each other. Um, you would listen for remote connections coming in and you would send your own video going up the wire. And again, this is with a library, so this isn't all the way down to the raw JavaScript. I'll show you some of that in a bit, but pretty straightforward. 
Here I'm creating a, uh, a, a WebSocket, so a secure WebSocket, and giving it the pin number, so the room number, basically. Um, so it has a connection. Whilst that's, this will emit events saying I'm connected, and, um, and whilst that's happening, I will then add an event listener to listen for when a new stream comes in. So I get two, two objects coming in. More, most importantly, the actual video stream is that stream object. Um, and the, the WebRTC IO library has a helper called uh, attach stream, which you give it a stream, you give it an ID of an element on the page, and it'll just put the two together. Um, but it's as simple as doing video.source equals URL.create uh, URL object. I, I, I've got a slide in a moment that shows you how to actually do that by hand. Um, but it's, that will just put a video feed together. And then the third part is actually capture the video from your, your laptop or your phone or whatever device and send up the stream as well. And this is all tucked away for me. So I just do rtc.create stream, video yes, audio yes or no. Um, and in the case of my game, because I only wanted the opponent's face on the game and not my own, I just throw away the actual stream. I don't do anything with it. And behind the scenes, the library has basically sent that up the peer-to-peer -peer, um, connection, and it's streaming it to the other user. That's it. So the lessons for me here were libraries are super good when you're fumbling your way through the actual code, right? There's not a lot there, and I've got that prototype working. I've got peer-to-peer -peer data working already. Um, but the lesson here is that libraries also hide away a lot of the technology, and there were bugs in my code that I hadn't realized even existed in the first place. Um, in my experience, that's the right way to approach. Like, if you don't understand the technology, take a library, start off with that, build a thing, and then understand what's going on. It's kind of a, I wrote a long blog post about uh, using going beyond jQuery, and it's exactly that. I would start with jQuery and work my way back to how it all works. Um, but the, the, the really, the big thing for me was peer-to-peer -peer data. I seem to have this impression in my head that peer-to-peer -peer must be faster. All right? And if, if we tried it here, if I had a, um, uh, uh, the game running here and one of you wanted to connect to the game, it would work out that we're on the same network, so it'd be really quick. But this game I wanted to work between you know, the UK and the US, I wanted to be able to play people over the open web. Um, and that's not particularly faster. And that's still going a long way over the wire. So because my game only has this tiny little face at the other end, I don't want to be, I'm not doing a Skype clone, right? I don't need to send an HD video down the wire. I don't want to send this massive video down the wire. Um, so initially, I didn't think there was any way of actually controlling how much data goes over the wire. But you do have a way of saying, here are some options. Beyond just saying, true, I, I want video, you can say, I want the max width of the video to be you know, 160 in my case. So the, the actual, it's kind of like a thumbnail video that goes down the wire. Less data is, if you need, if you don't need as much data, that's good, right? It's less data on your uh, mobile device, it's less bytes over the wire for your mobile device to, to um, process. Um, I looked at, on my Android, looked at the amount of data that Chrome had gone through and it was gigs worth of data when I was testing. So you imagine gigs worth of data on a, uh, a normal cell network, it's uh, gonna get expensive. Um, so, this is kind of a, an, a, an old good one, but you know, only serve what you need. And in this, I found that because I was using a library, this didn't work. I was giving it these arguments saying, only serve this uh, 160 video. But inside the library, I realized that it was just looking for the presence of a, a value on video. And if I had an object there, it just said, yeah, it's true, so send the whole thing. So it was sending by default 640 by 480, which isn't really HD, but it's a lot bigger than I needed. But I can do a you know, pull request and, and fix it. But I only found that out after I finished with the, uh, the library. You probably spotted already that it's not entirely client side as well. Um, so you do need, you don't absolutely need a server. You can do it entirely um, in the client side. But you need to be able to know what the IP address of the, the person you're trying to connect to. And typically, you want to be able to give someone a pin number or a color to connect through, right? So the game is enter pin and you have that discoverability. So you still need, you still need the server, um, and literally this is all the code I have on my server side. I have, not for the entire game, but for the WebRTC part. I've got an express server. Once that's uh, created, I just wrap it up with the WebRTC library, and the other libraries are very similar. They just kind of wrap around your, your web server, and they do all the work for you. I, in my live production code, I have no more than that to do with the, the WebRTC stuff. It's just that one line. So it just handles it for me. It, create, it, it handles creation of rooms. It handles um, trying to 
work out the discoverability part, and it's, it's all magic from my point of view. Um, if I wanted to add fallback support for iOS, for instance, that didn't have the peer connection API, I would use this socket to send messages up to it. So when someone took a photo of their, their face, it would send up the web socket here. I would send that down to the connected client. And I could add fallback support using this web socket. This was the interesting part to me, uh, the RTC data channel. There's no permissions for this. You just create a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Um, and at the moment, there's, uh, there's an options object that you pass in that sets either reliable to true or reliable to false. Reliable true means you have a TCP connection, uh, which is, it, it, according to the spec, is default. So if you don't pass in that value, you, you have a TCP connection. If you set reliable to false, then it creates a UDP connection. Okay. Um, I did read a comment inside of some code uh, that says that Chrome at the moment doesn't support TCP reliable connections, but it's quite likely if, if someone's watching this in the future um, that that's not true anymore, that's fixed. And it's quite likely that the comment's already out of date because it's moving so quickly. If, uh, if you guys and girls are already using WebSockets, hopefully you're doing this already. You actually test that the WebSocket's open before you start trying to send data over that WebSocket. And you have to do the same thing with the, da uh, the, data, the data channel. Um, in this case, I'm looping over my data channels and saying, it, is the ready state open? And if it is, then I will use it. If it's not, then the game isn't ready in the first place, right? The weird thing is the ready state is actually a string, whereas I'm kind of used to the ready state as being an integer, but it's, it's just part of the spec. Um, and hopefully you're doing this with WebSockets anyway. Originally, I wanted to stream the orientation events directly over the peer data API, which would have, I mean, if you've ever looked at the orientation events, it just, it just bombards the uh, device with data, just, just pours out. Um, and then I was like, oh, that's a lot of data. I'll throttle this and only send it every 250 milliseconds. Which is, in the end, there's no point, right? It, there's three states in my game. The user is standing up. They're either left or they're right, or left and right. Um, so why not actually put that in the, the client side? So instead of sending that data and having the peer work out if they've tilted left or right, just I, I put the, all the logic on the client side and try and send as little amount of data over the wire as possible. Um, and in this case, I say if the user's phone has tilted over to the right, then their state has changed, send that one message to the peer. Okay, so you're still sending bytes over, the, over the, the internet. I had this misconception that peer data would be so much faster and so much, e uh, so much less data, but it's, it's not. It's just closer. There's no, there's the, you know, if we're in the same network, then great, but it sh should be over the wire. So I just want to explain the, the mechanics of this game before I kind of uh, uh, show you the, the biggest ball ache I hit, basically. Um, before the game can start, you need, I needed to open a WebSocket to the game discovery, um, connect to the video and audio stream. Once that was done, I would test if the, uh, the, peers, the, the peer connection was actually open and I could talk to it. It was in a ready state, and if that's the case, then the game is ready to be played and you can throw balls at each other's face. So, my game was a multi-page website. You'd, be, you, you'd get this welcome page that's had two buttons, that's kind of join the game or start a game. If you uh, start a game, then it would automatically create the room for you, give you a pin number, and you'll go and tell your friend what the pin number is. And your friend would say, okay, I'm gonna go join a game, um, and they would enter the pin, and when they hit refresh, or when it hit submit, it would go to this waiting state. And uh, the start game would be in a waiting state, it would have a hanging XHR on the server side, and when the server side's um, uh, uh, state machine went from waiting to ready, it would close the XHR request, which would cause both pages to reload into the, the play the game. And once we're playing the game, I then ask for the streams from both users at the same time and try and connect them. But that didn't work. Uh, what happened is I get to the game, I see the video, and it would instantly vanish. So uh, yeah, it took quite a while to work out what was actually going on. And I have an analogy. And I've explained this to my wife, who doesn't do tech at all, and she kind of got it. So I'm hoping that you guys and girls can get this as well. And if I don't, just ask me afterwards. So this is my analogy. I want to make a call to you, OK? I've got my paper cup phone, and I've got both ends. I've got my, my paper cup, the string, and the paper cup at the bo bottom, and you have the same thing. I put my paper cup up to my, up to my ear, and I hand you the other end. And you do the same thing. You put your paper cup to, up to your ear, and you hand me the other end. I'm like, okay, right, I'll take that. 
and I'll put it up to my ear and take, out, take off the, the end that I was holding before. And you do the same thing, you take the phone off me and put it up to your ear, putting down the other end, and we're both standing there with dangling phones. So we're not actually talking to each other, we've just got this kind of long ear thing. No one's talking to each other. The point is it was happening at the same time and the, the connections were kind of missing each other. Now I don't know, because I haven't dug into this deeply enough, if, th if this is a bug in uh, the library that I was using, whether it is a bug in the workflow, or what's more likely that it was a bug that I was hitting because of the way I was developing and because of the deadline I was against. I needed to, it needed to be live for Google I.O., so I needed a solution to get around this problem of the two users trying to connect at the exact same time. So I created a single page app. And what that did is, um, it, as soon as you go to start the game, it would immediately ask you for your, your uh, audio and video stream. So you say, yeah, okay, and you got the pin number, and then you say to your friend, here's my pin number. And because of that time delay between that, those two points, the stream is already open, and it's, the stream's already being fed into that room, this imaginary room in the cloud or wherever it is. They enter their PIN number because it happens not at the same time. If there's some delay, then that user can connect to you properly, and there's no both of you trying to connect at the same time. It worked. That was the important bit. But there is, um, there is a point to a single-page app. If you have created a, 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 a WebRTC stream or things like going full screen, um, as soon as a page refreshes, that gets broken. So once, if, your, if your app is in full screen mode, when you hit refresh, it drops out of full screen. So these things that use these kind of persistent states in the, in the browser, you might need to actually make a single page app that kind of loads in each one of these pages. Now I only, I, my app is still, or my site is still a welcome page, and then the rest of it is a single page app, which meant that I couldn't just add full screen, I added full screen right at the end. I would have liked to have on the welcome screen, go to full screen, go to full screen and then start playing the game, but because I have a refresh between welcome and join, I couldn't do that. Um, and also this can get a bit annoying in your game. Like if you, if you do refresh the game, so once, once the game's over, you hit reload and you start again. If you add SSL, the, the desktop browsers won't keep asking for permission to access the, uh, the webcam. On the mobile device, this was true when I started the project, and it was false by the time I ended the project. And it's not like it took a long time. I mean, it was probably a month's worth of dev. But because I was working beta, this stuff changed underneath my feet. Um, what happens on uh, mobile is because there's no visual cue that there's a video stream open on the phone, they, can't, they always ask you for permission. Okay? On a desktop, you have a light, generally, that tells you your webcam's on. On a mobile phone, you don't have that. And even better than that, I found that um, when I had an open stream, I could turn my phone off or put it in standby mode, put it down, walk away, and forget that that's, that camera is still on and feeding a stream to the remote peer. So your phone can be off and the camera will still be feeding data over the wire. Makes your phone really, really hot. So I've got a bit of time to talk about the graphics side of things. Um, and I'm not... I'm a developer in terms of, I, I know like black, white, and gray, that's as far as my graphic skills go. And um, I'm not a 3D programmer, and it kind of is a bit of a mind fuck. Um, so I'm not gonna go into that detail, basically. Um, I knew that I had a 3D scene. I had this little character in the background, I had this idea of like old school 80s Tron style you know, floor, and you throw balls into the, the, the 3D space and hit them in the face. And my original plan was to do this all with a DOM. I was like, well, I can just do, you know, scale on that and make it smaller, and it'd be fine. And um, I sat down with, um, or I asked Seb Lead Lyle, who's speaking, I think, on Friday uh, towards the end, if he'd just kind of give me some advice on the 3D stuff. And uh, the first thing he said is, no, that's going to be shit. Um, probably not a direct quote, but... Um, I need to use 3.js to do this work. And I'm not familiar enough with 3.js, so I sat down with him, he gave me a couple of hours of his time, and created this beautiful scene where I had this kind of 3D uh, floor and the characters were in the right place, and all the perspective felt right as well. Like, my character wasn't too big for the, the, the angle of the camera and so on, it looked great. So I went away with that information, you know, my awesome 3.js uh, scene, put it on uh, my mobile phone, and the frames per second went down about seven frames per second. Everything was like this slow motion, ball throwing through the air. It was horribly, horribly slow. Um, and in fact, at this point, I had two canvases on the screen and one video, and everything was going to complete crap. 
But even with one canvas and 3.js, it just wasn't quick enough during that initial, uh, initial test. And this is on a Nexus 4 as well, so it's kind of their you know, hero product. So I started looking at the CSS3 renderers, um, but because I'm on an experimental browser that says beta, on it, it's not, you know, not going to be a perfect, perfectly working browser. I found that when my floor was in front of me, completely you know, flat, it was fine. But as soon as I tilted it forward into a 3D space, it would just vanish. Um, kind of a problem. Uh, but then it turned out that there was just a bug that had been fixed over the weekend, at the coming weekend that I found the issue, and it was just fixed. Um, but I decided not to use the 3D renderer because I, I, it had the performance, but the floor was missing. So. Um, I found that actually the problem was I was rendering too much of a canvas constantly on the screen. I was doing, you know, I was doing my loop to redraw the entire thing, which included like a big background, my character, the ball, and so on. So I basically created two, two views. Um, one was for the static background that got rendered once or every now and then that I needed to update the background, and then one separate canvas that did as little as possible, which is basically the ball that bounces down and throws towards the face. Um, I found that putting two videos and a canvas on a mobile phone is probably a little bit too much with all the streams going on. And when I had two videos, the frame rates weren't right down. I got rid of one of the videos because I had the local video in there for some reason. No, just no good reason, just it happened to be in the DOM. Took that out and my frame rate, rates went back up to, I think actually I got about 50 frames per second on uh, uh, Nexus 4, which is, which is pretty good. Uh, the Nexus 7 on the other hand is a little bit uh, not as, not as strong on the, uh, the performance side. Um, but I had a lot of this, creating, like hacking around with 3.js and, and all of the uh, real-time stuff going on at the same time and my rendering. Um, I would basically get this. I'd just change something and yeah, it would work. And once I got to that, I'd just move on. That's quite happy for me. I've got a deadline to work to, so uh, I kept going. Um, some useful, really useful tips I got out of uh, Seb actually was to create meshes to understand what's going to collide with something else. So for collision detection, um, I had this debug view so I could see where the ball was going and if the character tilted to the left, occasionally that face thing would just kind of launch off to the side and I could see I had a bug in my code. So it was nice to have a debug view for that, that 3D part of the game. And probably the hardest part of the entire game was taking my mug, my face, and making it appear at the right height and width in the 3D space. Um, Stephen Whittens, who's talking as well, tried to give me some help in, in projecting that into a 3D space. There was a lot of ugly code that eventually did it, and most of it was Seb and some, uh, some kind of lead from uh, Stephen as well, but uh, 3D is not my space. I was good at the, the real-time stuff. This was really difficult. Um, but I managed to submit it, um, and it did go live. Um, it did end up at, um, being shown at Google I.O. Um, as one of the experiments. Um, but the, the, the biggest lessons I got from this entire project, they weren't code-based. They actually turned out to all be planning-based. Um, the, uh, the time to actually work on such a new technology, at this point in time, there's not that much information out there. There's some good videos, but they're very deep dive uh, uh, videos. Um, I expect that to change with time. Um, the Google engineers are actually really good. For all this new technology, they want developers using this stuff, and they will answer questions and give you a hand. I was really surprised at how much help I got. It wasn't, you know, they weren't writing my code for me, but they were giving me feedback and suggestions. Uh, Paul Kinlan helped me with that, the, the single page app solution. He was looking at it, and he managed to work out where it was happening, and, and, and basically said I need to move to a single page app, which was a pain, but, you know, I did it. Um, and the biggest thing was maybe the horse came before the cart. Like, um, I think I focused a lot on the technology and didn't really think too much about the, game's mechanic, the, the game mechanics. I'm not 100% sure if it's a good game. Like, I could have quite easily tested the game without any of the technology, but I focused on that tech. And now I have a game, it's playable, and it's cool as a demo, but whether it's like one of those addictive games, I'm not too sure. Um, I really would love to say WebRTC is really ready for prime time. I don't think. It's quite there yet for developers. At the bottom, it does say check the expiry date. Like, that's going to change quickly. And I'm, I'm pretty certain in 12 months' time, we will be at a place where we can quite happily use WebRTC in big projects. And uh, we're going to see it in a lot more. I, I'm confident we'll see it in a lot more places. The resources will, there'll be more tutorials, screencasts, 
more talks on uh, WebRTC. Um, mobile's looking pretty, uh, pretty good. Microsoft support, I have no clue what's going on there, so I don't know what interoperability is going to look like. Um, but it works, so, you know, yay us. Um, I wanted to hit on a high note, so that's kind of uh, my, my way of saying WebRTC is actually pretty cool to play with, but it's maybe kind of a playground uh, uh, at the moment. Um, there is code and uh, all the source code is online, so you can kind of help yourself. Don't judge me too much um, when you're kind of like, what, what, really, what, where are the comments, that kind of thing. Um, there are tests that are coming, and, um, but it's, it's all online, you can have a play. Uh, I don't think I've got time for questions, but you can kind of ask me anything later on. I'm sure I'll have a beer in my hand at some point or another. Um, so with that, I think my time's up, and thanks for listening. <laughs>